All right, let's dive in. Today, we're tackling storage backends for high availability Proxmox setups. Nice. Yeah, specifically a two node setup. Think two HP DL20 servers, you know, 64 DB of RAM each, SSDs for the OS and VMs, and a third PC for Quorum. Sounds like a solid setup. It is, but now the big question, Ceph or ZFS? A classic dilemma. Right. Both are popular with Proxmox users, both have their strengths, but which one's the best fit for a two-node setup? That's what we're figuring out today. And sometimes the answer isn't as obvious as you'd think. Exactly. The more powerful option on paper isn't always the best. So true. Okay, before we get into the WHY, let's make sure we're all on the same page. What are Ceph and ZFS? Imagine you're explaining them to, I don't know, your grandma. How would you break it down? Okay, so Ceph, think of it like a team of servers all working together to manage your storage. It's all about spreading data across multiple machines, making it super scalable. And if one server crashes, no worries, the others have got your back. Okay, so Ceph is the team player, built for the big leagues. Got it. What about ZFS? ZFS is more like that super organized, meticulous friend. It's a file system, AND, a volume manager. So it handles how data is stored, AND, organized on your drives. Everything's perfectly in place and protected. It's amazing for smaller setups where you really prioritize simplicity and reliability. I'm liking this. So Ceph, the team, ZFS, the individual, makes sense. But if Ceph is all about handling tons of data and being fault tolerant, why wouldn't it be the automatic choice for high availability, even with just two nodes? Well, here's the thing. Ceph, with all its distributed awesomeness, really shines when it has at least three nodes to work with. That's how it replicates data across multiple servers, you know, yeah. make sure it's accessible even if one node goes down. So it's like it needs that extra support to really be effective. Yeah, exactly. With only two nodes, it loses some of that redundancy. Mm. Sure, you got a quorum node to help with decision making, but it doesn't actually store data. So if a storage node fails, you're kind of stuck. Plus, with SSDs and maybe no super fast network, you might even see some performance issues. Hmm. So maybe Ceph is actually overkill or even a bit clunky in this smaller, faster setup. Yeah, it's not always about raw power, right? It's about the right tool for the job. Exactly. So how does ZFS handle this two-node situation? Is it better suited? Much better. With ZFS, you can set up mirroring between your nodes. It's like having an identical twin for all your data, constantly kept up to date on both servers. OK, so it's like built-in backup, always in sync. Exactly. One server goes down, the other one is ready to go with a complete copy of everything. No need for complex systems, no third storage node, just simple, efficient mirroring, perfect for two nodes. Starting to see why ZFS is a contender here. It steps in, keeps a copy on each node, all set. And what about those snapshots? Do they add to ZFS's reliability? Oh, absolutely. Snapshots are one of ZFS's best features. Imagine taking a picture of your entire storage setup at any moment. If something goes wrong, you can just rewind back to that snapshot. So it's like an undo button for your data. That's amazing, especially in a high availability setup. Right. Say a software update goes haywire, or you accidentally delete something crucial, just roll back to a previous snapshot. Yeah. Problem solved. That's got to be a lifesaver. OK, I'm sold on the concept, but is there a catch? Any downsides to ZFS in this scenario? Well, there are a couple of things to consider. One, while ZFS gives you that fantastic replication, it doesn't automatically fail over. Oh. So if a server crashes, you'll have to manually promote the standby node to take over. Right. It's not hard, but it does require some manual action, which could mean a bit of downtime. So a bit more hands-on than stuff. What else? The other thing is that quorum node, which you're smart to have already, in a two-node setup, it's the tiebreaker. Tiebreaker. Yeah, like if your servers lose communication with each other, without that third vote, they could both think they're in charge. Mm -hmm. And that could lead to, well, data chaos. So it keeps them from fighting over who's the boss. Exactly. It's that neutral judge making sure everything stays in order, no data conflicts. You could even use a Raspberry Pi for this. It's not about power, just that third voice. Makes sense. OK, so summing up what we've got so far, for this two-node HA setup, ZFS is looking like the simpler, maybe even more reliable choice. Right. It's got that great replication, those rewindable snapshots, right. and it's easier to manage than something like Ceph in this case. Definitely. So right now, simplicity and rock-solid reliability are winning. But is there ever a time when Ceph might be the better option, you know, for future planning? Oh, for sure. Things change, needs evolve. If you're planning on expanding, adding more servers, maybe getting some dedicated 10 dB networking, then Ceph's scalability and automatic failover start to look really good. 
So if you're thinking big, aiming for massive scale and top tier performance, then Ceph's worth another look down the road. Absolutely. Good to know we've got options as things change. It's all about choosing the right tool at the right time. Yeah, it really seems like ZFS is the way to go for this setup. Totally. So we've got the WHY for ZFS. Let's get practical. You've got those two HP DL20 servers already. Where does ZFS actually fit in? It's like the foundation of your storage. You'll create something called a zoo pool. Think of it as one big storage container that spans both servers. Instead of seeing separate drives, you've got this pool they both share and use. Ah, so it's like merging their storage into one big virtual space. Exactly. Cool. So uh, how do we actually make that happen? It's pretty straightforward, especially because Proxmox has great ZFS support. First, you install ZFS on both servers. Then, create your zoo pool, pick the disks you want to use, and decide how you want to handle redundancy. We can get into that in a bit. Install ZFS, create the zoo pool. Got it. Then what? We've got the pool, but how do we use it for our VMs and data? Inside this pool, you'll create data sets. Think of them like folders or volumes where you'll organize everything, like one for VM disks, another for ISO images, one for backups, you name it. Keeps things neat and tidy. Like compartments in our big storage container. Love it. And what about that real-time replication we talked about? How do we make sure our data is mirrored on both servers? ZFS replication. You'll configure ZFS to automatically mirror those data sets from one server to the other. It's like having a live, constantly updating backup on the second server. And it's super efficient. Only the changes are sent, not the whole data set every time. Saves bandwidth, keeps things fast. Smart. Now those snapshots, those undo buttons, how do they work and how often should we be taking them? Think of them as taking a picture of your data at that moment. You can take as many as you want. Daily, hourly, depends how often your data changes. The more you take, the more control you have if you need to restore. So it's a balance between risk and how granular you want your recovery to be. Exactly. But doesn't taking tons of snapshots eat up storage? Nope. ZFS snapshots are amazingly space efficient. They don't copy the whole data set each time. They just store the changes made since the last snapshot. So you can take them frequently without filling up your storage. Exactly. Like having tons of save points without needing a massive hard drive. Makes sense. Okay, so we've got our spool, data sets, replication, and snapshots. What's next? Is this where Proxmox HA comes in? Right on. Proxmox HA, or high availability, manages the whole failover process. It's the brains that keep your virtual machines running, even if a server goes down. Because just having the data mirrored isn't enough. We need something to manage how the cluster reacts if a server fails. Exactly. Proxmox HA lets you decide how your VMs behave during failover. Like if you have a web server and a database server that need to run together, you can group them and Proxmox HA makes sure they stick together even if a server goes down. Okay, so it's about defining relationships, making sure things that rely on each other stay together. What about fencing? Where does that fit in? Fencing. That's one of those things you don't see, but it's super important. Imagine a server goes down, then suddenly comes back online, but maybe it's confused. Oh, no. Yeah, that could cause chaos. Fencing is like a safety mechanism that prevents that. Like a circuit breaker, isolating a potentially problematic server. Exactly. Keeps the failover process clean and controlled. No split brain situations. No server arguments. So we've covered Z-Pool, data sets, replication, snapshots, Proxmox HA with fencing. Anything else we should know about setting up high availability Proxmox with ZFS? There are some extra things like network config for HA traffic and setting up monitoring tools, but those get pretty specific to your needs. Okay, so we've laid a strong foundation here. It sounds like we've covered all the technical stuff for a super reliable Proxmox cluster with ZFS. But I think there's something even more important for our listener as they get started. Totally agree. It's not just about checking off boxes and settings. It's about really understanding ZFS and Proxmox HA, fine-tuning them to fit how you work. It's like having all the best ingredients, but then you got to experiment, add your own flair to make it truly amazing. Exactly. Embrace the learning process, set up some test VMs, play with the configurations, that's how you become a master. Love that. Don't be afraid to experiment, to tinker, to push things a bit. That's how you figure out what works best for you. And remember, if you get stuck, there's a whole Proxmox community out there ready to help. For sure. The Proxmox community is incredibly helpful and knowledgeable. There are forums, docs, blogs, videos, a whole world of support. So to sum it all up, what's the most important thing for our listener to remember as they start using ZFS for their Proxmox cluster? Start simple. Build from there, get comfortable with the ZFS basics, build that Z pool, set up replication, play with snapshots, 
Nail those down, then explore Proxmox HA as you get more confident. Like learning a new language. You don't jump into writing a novel before you learn the alphabet. Right. And don't be afraid to make mistakes. That's how we learn and grow. Couldn't have said it better. Well, I think we've given everyone a clear picture of why ZFS is a great choice for a two-node Proxmox setup and how to get started. As you keep exploring Proxmox and ZFS, remember one thing. It's your setup. Make it work for you. Exactly. Build the system that helps you do your best work. And on that note, time to wrap up this deep dive. We've covered a lot. Ceph versus ZFS, the steps to set up a rock-solid Proxmox cluster. But before we go, one final thought. Now that you've seen the power of ZFS, what's your next step? Going to dive into some tutorials, chat with the Proxmox community, figure out that next step, and then go for it. It's been great diving into this with you. Same here. And to everyone listening, keep experimenting, keep learning, and keep diving deep. Until next time, happy Proxmoxing.